talk about the social construction of gender and the biological essentialist theory of gender. So these are two competing theories of gender which you're going to come across within feminism. Um, feminists, you know, one particular school of thought within feminism has advocated um, the need to look at gender as socially constructed. But let's compare these two theories uh, to get a better understanding of them. So these are, you know, competing theories of gender. We have on the one hand biological essentialism and on the other the social construction of gender. So biological essentialism is actually the common sense notion of gender. So your average person on the street, most people that you talk to in your family, will probably think that gender is biologically essential. And there's actually a lot of you know, a lot of things in the media which would lead you to believe that that's a fact. And so it's kind of this common sense notion that we can actually map gender onto bodies, right? So the biologically essentialist theory argues that gender, right, male or female, our notions of male or female, are actually a product of these factors, sex organs, hormones, and DNA. In other words, the body itself, right, the sex of the body is what determines the gender. So in feminism, we actually distinguish sex from gender, where the term sex refers to the actual biological sex of the body, and gender refers to a whole lot more than that. So gender refers to you know, desires, traits, proclivities, capacities, talents, strengths, weaknesses, and actually that affects jobs, opportunities, rights. So they're actually two different terms. We tend to use them interchangeably in everyday conversation. But biological sex refers to the body, and gender refers to male and you know masculine and feminine, right? The two genders. So what the biological essentialist would say is that we get gender from the body. It's a direct one-to-one -one correspondence. So a baby is born, and you can look at the baby or make certain measurements on a baby and figure out what its gender is just by knowing its biological sex, right? So you can do things like look at the sex organs. Right? So if a, a person has a vagina and breasts, then that person is a female, right? If the person has penis and testicles and does not have a vagina and breasts, then that person is a male, right? And so a biological essentialist would say all of our notions of male and female, masculine and feminine, come directly out of the body. So we can, you know, we can either look at these sex organs, right, reproductive organs in particular, or we can look at hormones. That can also tell us whether someone is a male or a female. So you have so much testosterone, so much progesterone. Um, we have several hormones in the body, testosterone, progesterone, androgen, and there's another one that starts with an E that I'm forgetting. <laughs> um, but there are some hormones that um, are associated with women and some with men because women tend to have more progesterone than testosterone. Men tend to have more testosterone. Both men and women have androgen, right? And so some biological essentialists will say, well, you could just look at the hormones and that will tell you whether a person is male or female and that will also explain a person's behavior, um, you know, and tendencies, etc. right? So you'll hear a lot of arguments about how the reason men are into sports is because they have testosterone, or the reason that men are violent is because they have testosterone, or the reason that men rape is because they have testosterone. The, women, the reason that women are good at taking care of babies is because they have so much progesterone, um, etc. Right? So there'll be these associations, these direct mappings between how many hormones you have and what your traits, desires, proclivities, and capacities are, right? Now, you can also look at DNA. So a biological essentialist might also say, well, all you have to do is, is test 
a child, does it have an X chromosome, a Y, if it's got an X and a Y, it's a male, if it has two X's, it's a woman, right? So males are XY, women are XX, and so your chromosomes actually determine whether you're male or female. Okay. Now, a biological essentialist is actually going to say that we can use science, right? We can use observation or the scientific method to measure these things or just our vision to observe, you know, the vagina, right, the sex organs, and that we can, from that information, you know, get a lot of other information, right? So biological essentialists don't just say that we can look at a child and tell whether it's a male or a female, they actually extend that to say we can look at someone's sex organs and tell whether or not that person is masculine or feminine, whether or not they have traits of being nurturing, or whether they're more violent, whether they're more athletic, whether they're more logical, whether they're um, more emotional, right? So biological essentialism argues that we can actually determine gender through some aspect of the body and once you know those particular aspects of the body then you know a lot more right you actually know what that person's desires are what their traits are what their proclivities are what their capacities are what their talents are what their strengths are what their behavior will be what their weaknesses are and this in turn can be used to determine you know who is appropriate for a particular job who ought to have certain opportunities right uh, what your purpose for existence is, right? If you're a woman, is your purpose to have babies, right? To be a mother? Um, what rights should you have, right? Um, should men have uh, more right to do physically taxing labor because they have more testosterone and it's easier for them to engage in certain types of physical labor? Um, parenting, you know, what are the responsibilities of mothers versus fathers, right? We have these ideas that women are naturally nurturing, biologically so, and so they have certain responsibilities as parents that males don't have because they're not naturally nurturing. It's not natural for a man to want to pick up a baby or hold a baby or soothe a baby. They don't have it within their physical makeup to do that. And so we don't have the same expectations of a father that we'd have for a mother, right? So the biological essentialists will argue that there is something essentially male or essentially female about these different bodied people. So that if you know somebody's physical facts, their sex organs, their hormones, their chromosomes, then you actually know um, something essential about them. What do, I, what do I mean by essential? I mean it's something innate, something that's a part of who you are. It's your essence, right? So it's not something that's, you know, in addition to who you really are or, you know, added to who you really are. So it's not like, um, you know, your decision to go into carpentry as a, you know, vocation. Um, that's not your essence, right? But... A biological essentialist believes that there are certain essential characteristics that men have and that women have on the basis of biology. Okay? Now let's contrast that with the social constructionist view. Right? And you have some readings like Lorber and Fry, which explicitly talk about this. You have a number of readings, Nicholson, etc., um, who talk about the social construction of race. And what people like Lorber argue is that, in fact, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the body the biological sex, and the actual gender as defined by society. And so what the social constructionists say is that gender is a social construct. It's something created by societies, that societies define male and female for particular reasons, and that it has nothing to do with any kind of essence that we're born with. So we're not, women are not born nurturing. They're not born uh, highly emotional. They're not born loving to shop. They're not born... Uh, liking to adorn themselves and wear makeup and spend a lot of time on their clothing. But that society teaches women that in order to be acceptable, to be an acceptable woman, to be defined as feminine, you have to have your hair long, you have to wear makeup, you have to take care in your appearance, you have to have children, you have to have a certain attitude towards children, you have to have a certain emotional affect, right, in order to be defined as womanly or feminine. And for men too, men aren't supposed to cry. So it's not that men are less likely to cry naturally or essentially because of their biological makeup, but that their condition or taught uh, by society what is appropriate behavior 
in order to be a man. Okay. There are certain punishments for men who cry, right? So if a man cries in public or cries in front of women, he will often be chastised or in some way there'll be some sort of consequence for his crying. And the same is true for women when it comes to anger. So we have certain notions of, you know, what's acceptable female emotion and what's acceptable male emotion. So women are encouraged not to be angry, and a woman who gets angry is often punished. So, for example, we use the B word, right? A woman who gets angry or who is bossy or who is an authority figure or who is very professional will often be called a bitch, right? A man with the same exact traits will be called masculine, right? It's normal for a man to get angry. It's normal for a man to cuss. It's normal for a man to raise his voice. It's normal for a man to tell other people what to do right? But for a woman to do it is somehow not so feminine, and so something must be wrong with her. So then she gets labeled or name-called or in some way, um, you know, has some sort of negative consequence, right? And the same is true for men who act in ways which we consider, society considers to be feminine. And so what the social constructionists say is that gender is not a product of the body, of these physical mechanisms, but in fact, gender is a construction of society that is engineered through the use of particular props like clothing. Lorber talks about how from the time a child is born, we dress it in particular colors to label it. Fry also talks about this, sex marking, right? We sex mark ourselves in terms of our clothing, our behavior, our way of speaking, right? How we sit, how we hold our bodies, and that there's this, all of this reinforcing behavior, that we have to behave in certain ways if we're women, so that if a woman sits, she's supposed to sit in a very closed way, you know, her arms are supposed to be kind of, you know, near her side, and if you could, you know, see me sitting, you know, I have to, you know, have my, my legs crossed, or, you know, I have to, uh, you know, cross them or somehow close them, whereas if I'm a man, you know, I can kind of, you know, stretch out, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, lean back and, you know, take up a lot of space. I can, you know, open my legs and, you know, sit with my crotch exposed, right? And I can just kind of take up space. But women are supposed to kind of have a more closed posture, right? And if you don't have a closed posture, then what are people going to say to you? Oh, that's very unladylike. That's very improper. That's very rude for you to sit with your legs open, or, you know, your, you know your, your chest out, right? Showing off your breasts or what have you, right? Um, and so we have all of these social um, mechanisms and all of these sex marking ways and all of these um, kind of behaviors that we're taught. And then we have whole institutions dedicated to teaching us how to be men and women. So our religious institutions, our educational institutions, um, in school there are different sets of rules for boy students and girl students, there are different dress codes, um, there are different expectations with regard to fighting and talking back. Parents have different expectations, right? You'll see a lot of parents who, if they have a, a boy child, and the boy child is very rambunctious and runs around and makes a lot of noise, they'll say, oh, he's such a boy. But if a girl child behaves in that way, they will quickly reprimand them, quickly chastise them, and try to correct that behavior because it's considered inappropriate for a girl, right? Um... And so we have all these institutions and these behaviors. We have different, you know, tools like clothing and, um, you know, different kind of rewards for behavior, different expectations. And then it also is in our division of labor. So we have, you know, very different tasks assigned to men and women in the home, for example, and even to boys and girls. So you have families where the girls in the family are all washing dishes and helping mom cook and cleaning, and the boys don't have chores, or the only chores they have are taking out the garbage or mowing the lawn, right? So we have a division of labor in the household. And then with men and women in, in marriages, right? Um, today, even, most marriages, women do most of the housework, if not all of the housework. And so there's just division of labor in the home according to gender. And then in, of course, the economy, too. We have a, you know, a large preponderance of women in certain low-paying jobs that are associated with femininity, like secretarial work and child care and health care.
And then you have a much larger number of men in tasks or jobs which are associated with masculinity, like physical labor. They're also much higher paying jobs, right? So what the social constructionists would say is that by mapping sex onto all of these traits, desires, capacities, talents, strengths, behavior, proclivities, weakness, and sexuality, we then have a means of controlling women, right? We have a means of determining what jobs they have access to, what opportunities they have access to, what their purpose is. If you tell a woman that her purpose is to bear children, then you can control her reproductive rights. You can prevent her from having reproductive choices, right? Or you can prevent her from getting an education, as they used to do. They say, well, women are meant to have children. If they get educated, it won't be good for their reproduction, right? You can, you can make decisions about people's rights and also about how parenting should be done. And then also parenting reinforces these gender norms, right? So that mothers and fathers then teach boy children and girl children how to be men and women, how to be masculine and feminine, right? So these are the two theories of gender.